Uh, this is an animated map on the construction of the streetcar system. I found it online. It was done by some students at the U of M. And it correlates development. You see the population development in the black dots correlated to the development of the streetcar system. Uh, now, what we're going to do today, this is, uh, I'm calling this one Streetcar 101. And uh, it's just, we're just going to do kind of a basic history of the system. And then we'll get into it deeper in the next three weeks. We'll have one on, on uh, that goes through the cars and all the different types of streetcars. Uh, we'll have one that goes through uh, all the facilities that they owned. And then the final one will be on kind of all the behind the scenes operational stuff. You've probably seen this picture before. This is uh, from the, the front of Electric Railway, I'm, I'm sorry, from the front of Twin Cities by Trolley. And um, what I said in the book was, you know, if you were to go to a modern day traffic engineer and say, hey, let's do this. Let's build a railroad down the middle of all the streets. They would think you were nuts. And they would probably have, probably have you arrested or something. But um, the reason it happened and uh, the reason there was a railroad put in the middle of the street is if you go back to the Industrial Revolution, actually look before it, if you've been to any of the colonial era cities on the East Coast, you know, the old parts of Boston, Charleston, um, um, you know, Savannah, all those places, there, if you look at them, the, the colonial era part of it is all about a mile square. And you, you could walk anywhere within a half an hour in the city. Well, along comes the Industrial Revolution, and people start streaming in from the countryside, and the cities begin to grow, and now they're suddenly too big to walk around in, uh, to walk everywhere you needed. Uh, but it really didn't, unless you were uh, rich, you really couldn't have horses and carriages and stuff in the cities. That was really for, sort of for the wealthy elites. And so you needed some way to get around, and so the first thing they did was started running what they called omnibuses. And that which is where the term bus comes from. And they were simply large uh, carriages, and you'd pay a fare, and, and you'd ride around. Well, the streets had a tendency to be either very rough cobblestones, or they were dirt, which would turn to mud when it snowed, I mean, when it rained. And so they were looking for some better way to do it. Well, starting about 1830, the up-and-coming technology was the railroad. And it didn't take much. Uh, for somebody to figure out that an iron <coughs> wheel rolling on an iron rail had a whole lot less rolling resistance and so a horse could pull a lot more and pull it easier and it was a smoother ride. Uh-oh. Well, you're going to have to kind of uh, maybe find your way in the back or something, I but uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What? Um, and and so consequently, the, the first horse cars showed up in the 1830s in New York. Now, they really didn't get adopted very quickly. Um, it, was, uh, it wasn't until the 1850s that the horse cars really started um, to show up. But then they really sort of swept the country, and every town that was any town had a horse car line. Um, and so they first showed up in the Twin Cities. Uh, oh, I had a couple of little intro slides here, uh, just showing them in the later years, couple, three, four. This, by the way, is the Como Harriet line. This is, uh, you're on Hennepin Avenue at 28th Street, looking north on Hennepin. And uh, this is down, if you take the green line uh, and get off at the very last station in front of St. Paul Union Depot, you would be exactly where that streetcar is. The St. Paul Union Depot is just out of the, out of the frame to the right, on 4th Street in downtown St. Paul. And this is just a typical car. This is up at Plymouth and Sheridan in the north side. And uh, this is how they wide them out. They, uh, they had loops on a couple of the lines, but most of the time they wide out. And what the guy did was he went, you can see the track curving around to the right. He pulled into the side street, which is Sheridan. And now he's backing out onto Plymouth. You can see the track ends just one car length, and then he'll come forward. Um, <coughs> And there's downtown. By the way, see that crowd out in the street? This is 7th and Nicollet. Anybody remember the 620 Club? Which yeah. later became Moby Dick's. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but it, before that, it was the 620 Club. And, um, and so that's either a Como Harriet or a Brian Johnson car. But you see the crowd out in the street. Now, if you look at, uh, by the open rear door, you know the safety zone sign we have on the platform? Well, that's, that's a safety zone sign. And it was, uh, it was a somewhat naive attempt to protect those people because you'd have whole crowds of people waiting in the street. 
and you see cars going behind them. Then later, not there, but in a bunch of other places, they went and actually put safety islands up. And then, of course, automobiles would go across the safety island and hit people, so eventually they put bullnoses on, on the safety islands so that it would literally overturn any automobile that would try to, try to hit you. Oh, here's a standing load. Uh, we don't allow that. We don't do this ourselves, but this was pretty typical. Okay, now, now we're going to go back to the, to the dawn of time. So horse cars, uh, starting in the 1850s, very popular around the country. And they first showed up here in 1872 in St. Paul, the St. Paul City Railway. 18 now, now, there were two abortive attempts to, to open lines in Minneapolis. In 1869, there was something called the Minneapolis Horse Railway. And you know where the Milwaukee Road Depot is? Well, the, the Milwaukee Road Depot was down there at Washington and, and, and 3rd Avenue South. And the St. Paul and Pacific Depot, the predecessor to the Great Northern, was at 4th Avenue North in Washington. And so on 2nd Street, one block east of Washington, this little, rare, this little horse drawn railroad ran between the two depots. And it actually made most of its money hauling freight cars in interchange between the two railroads because there was not a track connection in Minneapolis between the Milwaukee Road and the Great Northern at the time. Well, it wasn't very successful, but they built a, lot, they built a line through downtown on Hennepin and they built down towards Seven Corners, but it went out of business in a year or two. Uh, and there was another abortive attempt that's not very well documented, but then in 1875 the Minneapolis Street Railway came in and that's the one that stuck. So, uh, of course, horse car technology, uh, this by the way, you'll notice it says 6th Street and uh, 8th Avenue. 8th Avenue is Chicago Avenue now. And so this is right next to the car barn uh, at uh, Franklin in Chicago. And what they're doing is they're changing out the teams, and they're changing out the teams because uh, this line was about six miles long, about three miles in South Minneapolis, out Chicago, and then about a couple, three miles out in Monroe Street, Northeast. And by the time that they did a 12-mile round trip, the horses were tired, or in this case, I think it's mules, if you look. I think they look like mules. One is a mule and one is a horse, isn't it? Anyway, uh, they would then change the teams out. Uh, and we know from uh, the newspaper stories that uh, they were doing about um, 14 miles a day, I'm sorry, about 40 miles a day on, on a, on a horse. Was it? was it 14 or 40 miles a day on the horses? And then they'd give them a rest for a couple of days and then they'd, uh, they'd put them out there again. But it took, it took about five, six horses to keep a, a horse car running. Aaron, do you know where this car barn was? Yeah, Frank. Chicago Avenue? Or? It's on Chicago Avenue at Franklin. That'd be the southwest corner we're looking. Uh, you got to look on electric railways in Minnesota. It's in there. Um, I can't tell you which corner it was on, uh, off the top of my head. And uh, and so uh, now, for most of the horse car period, they didn't have conductors. They only had a driver who was up on the front platform, and they would get on at the back platform, and they'd have to walk all the way up and put their, uh, put their uh, coins in a little fare box that was right behind the driver and then walk all the way back. And the Minneapolis City Council <laughs> and the St. Paul City Council were very unhappy about this because uh, it slowed operation uh, and they, they, the city charters, the franchises that the streetcar system had with the city uh, required that they have conductors and Twin City Lines simply ignored that. Pardon me, it wasn't Twin City Lines yet. It was still the Minneapolis Street Railway and the St. Paul City Railway. But er, fairly early on, they were both uh, owned by a, by a syndicate that was uh, headed by Thomas Lowry. So Thomas Lowry was in there early, but they were still separate companies until 1891. Um, so anyway, it was only in the late 1880s, um, the latter days of the horse cars, that finally Lowry gave in under pressure and hired conductors which of course doubled his labor because now you went from a one-person crew on a, a car to a two-person crew. Now the horse cars, oh, let's see, I'm still uh, getting ahead of myself. Uh, the horse cars <coughs> were built up to about two to three miles out from each of the downtowns. And, and there was not a connection between the downtowns. That was done with, uh, with uh, commuter trains starting in 1880. 
first the Great Northern, then the Milwaukee Road joined them, and, and then eventually the Minneapolis and St. Louis in 1886. And uh, the, each of these steam railroads ran hourly commuter trains. The Milwaukee Roads left each downtown on the hour, the Great Northerns left each downtown on the half hour, and the Minneapolis and St. Louis ones left each downtown at 15 after the hour, so they could kind of split the load. And uh, it took them only about a half hour to get between the two downtowns, and they each served intermediate stations. Matter of fact, there was a whole movement to kind of create suburban pastoral communities um, that were not in, considered in the city, although they were technically within the city limits. And these were the parks, St. Anthony Park, Saint, uh, and they were created by the commuter railroads. St. Anthony Park had both a Northern Pacific and a, a I mean, a, both a Minneapolis and St. Louis and a Great Northern Station. By the way, both those station buildings still exist. They're, they've been moved off site, but they're still in St. Anthony Park being used as houses. Um, the Neuer Park, Prospect Park, McAllister Park, and uh, Miriam Park were all stations, intermediate stations, uh, between Minneapolis and St. Paul that these uh, hourly trains um, would stop at. So anyway, um, and, uh, and now I'll get back to them in a minute. So all through the 1800s, horse cars worked, but they were looking for some kind of technological uh, means to mechanize horse cars. And the most obvious thing would seem to be the steam locomotive, because the steam locomotive was off-the-shelf technology. And by the time you got into the 1880s, it's like, hey, you know, the steam was the answer to everything. Um, the problem with steam locomotives in, uh, in a street railway setting was that they were rolling pollution sources. And um, the housewives hated it because it got soot and all over their laundry. You know, they rain down little burning cinders that would go and burn holes in your clothes. They created a lot of smoke and all that, and they, and they scared horses. And so the, uh, what you're looking at here is the Minneapolis, Lindale, and Minnetonka, which was the only, um, which was the only uh, steam-powered streetcar line in Minneapolis, and uh, the predecessor of our line. Um, it, ran out, it ran through downtown on Marquette Avenue, went out uh, Nicollet Avenue to 31st, crossed 31st, and then out here to Lake Harriet. Um, it ended down at 42nd Street, although eventually uh, they extended it to Lake Minnetonka, right through where we're sitting. Um, and from the day this thing opened, the residents were trying to shut it down for pollution reasons. Um, there were a lot of wealthy people who lived on Marquette Avenue, the upper end of Marquette Avenue in downtown and um, including, including Mr. Washburn. And um, it got to the point where uh, he actually, uh, the residents were actually able to get them to cut off the steam locomotives at 6th and Marquette and put on horses to drag the coaches down to Washington Avenue, the, the, the rest of the way in downtown to get rid of these things. It also caused them to experiment in 1885 and 1886 with a pioneer electrification within downtown, which was not successful. But in any event, steam locomotives, uh, and, and the reason that it's, uh, that it's got the car body on it was that this, that's what they called a dummy. And uh, the idea was that maybe the horses wouldn't think it was a steam locomotive and not get scared. <laughs> that's, that's, the re that's the reasoning behind that. It's, not, it's, it's just for show. This, by the way, this picture is taken at 31st and Nicollet. This little line not only came out here, but they also ran out Nicollet to, um, to 50th Street. And they ran across, out Nicollet to 37th, across 37th, and down to Minnehaha Falls. So this was a fairly extensive operation. And uh, Twin City Lines took it over in, in 1886. By the way, there's a, besides the Como Harriet line, which is a remnant of this, uh, the Nicollet bus garage that's over at 31st and Nicollet, the reason that there's a bus garage there is that the motor line, is what they called this, built a roundhouse there in 1884. And the roundhouse was eventually replaced by a streetcar factory and then a car barn. And the car barn was turned into a bus garage and now there's a second generation bus garage. But that's why that building is there, is because this little railroad opened up the roundhouse there. Anyway. 
So anyway, steam really wasn't the answer. Now, if you, uh, if, if you uh, read the, the previous issue of uh, Twin City Lines, I pretty much went through the story of cable cars. But cable cars were what you call a bridge technology. They were invented in 1873 in San Francisco, and they were very expensive to build and maintain, but they mechanized streetcars. And what you had was a stationary power source, um, a stationary steam engine uh, with big sheaves and a steel cable that was in this slot underneath the street. And the car was unpowered and reached down with the grip and grabbed the cable and was pulled along at 8, 9, 10, sometimes 12 miles an hour. And you could let go of the cable and that's how you stopped. And it was particularly handy because you could climb any hill with it. So this, of course, is the Selby Hill in St. Paul. And um, there were about 25 cities that had them. St. Paul was the most northerly. And they were a pain in the neck maintenance-wise, but they worked. And the other thing was um, you could haul, you could have a two- or three-car train and really increase your capacity with them. By the way, that two-steepled church is still down there in downtown St. Paul today. That tower to the right is the state capitol before they built That's it. correct. That's the original, <laughs> the, old, the old state capitol. So anyway, the, um, St. Paul built... Uh, two lines, uh, South Selby Avenue and then East 7th Street and, uh, and Minneapolis said, well, we have to have those too just because St. Paul has them, which is the way it works, you know. And, um, and so the Minneapolis City Council uh, said to Thomas Lowry, you have to, you have to build them. And he went out, sold the bonds, bought all the materials, <laughs> laid the materials out, but he said, hmm, you know, electric power is coming around, I want to experiment with one. And uh, he, he electrified the 4th Avenue line. Now, on electrification, there were, there were a couple of three guys that were trying to figure out how to do it. There was a guy named Charles Vandepole, and Vandepole was the guy who had put in the little experimental line on Marquette for the, of the motor line. His, his didn't work. And there was a guy named Leo Daft, and his didn't work. But there was a third guy named Frank Sprague. And Frank Sprague was the one who came up with how you uh, regulate the power, how you have a trolley pole that's sprung and sits on the wire, but most important, how you constructed the power truck with the motor geared to the axle in such a way that it didn't shake itself apart because track was uneven and the car went up and down. And it's what they call a wheelbarrow mount, where uh, the motor was, the motor was uh, geared to the axle and the motor... The, 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 axle could the axle could float up and down relative to the motor, uh, and that's the same technology that's under these streetcars today, uh, is the Sprague patents. And so uh, he, he started up his first line in late 1887 in Richmond, Virginia. It worked, and in, in, in what I think was the fastest adoption of any technology in the history of this country, you can take telephones, automobiles, internet, anything you think of, well, where you're, you're, there ain't a whole lot of room left, That's Bill. Right. Uh, and what I think was the fastest adoption of any technology in the history of this country, Sprague's patents swept the country, and in something like five years, about 90 percent of all the horse car lines were gone. And it was only another within another 10 years, the cable car, most almost all the cable car lines were gone, and the steam lines. Um, and that's because it was faster, cost about half as much to put in as cable car, and uh, now the cable cars would go, you know, 10 miles an hour, horse cars went 5 miles an hour. These things, these early things, and this, by the way, is the very first run of the Grand Avenue line in St. Paul. Minneapolis put its first one in in December of 1889. St. Paul's was a month later, in January of 1890. Uh, Lowry is on the front end of that somewhere. Also on the front end is Archbishop John Ireland. And Archbishop John Ireland in St. Paul was the mover behind getting the St. Paul one started because he wanted to co connect um, the uh, Archdiocese office downtown with St. Thomas College, the Catholic College. And that's what the Grand Avenue line did. And so, um, and so anyway, this is, this is 1890. By, by June of 1891, they had converted the entire system to electricity with the exception of the two cable car lines that hung on a little bit longer. Um, by the way, they, they also put in the first line between downtown Minneapolis and downtown St. Paul via University Avenue. That went in in 1890. And by 
about 1892 or three, all of those short line commuter trains between the two downtowns were gone. Even though they were faster between the downtowns, it took about, oh, it took about 45, 50 minutes on the streetcar which interestingly is exactly how long it takes on the green line but back then they didn't have any traffic lights or anything to deal with um, and the commuter trains made it in about 30 minutes they were more expensive you had to go to the depot downtown uh, and and they only ran once an hour whereas these things were running every 10 minutes so the public voted with their feet and uh, went and rode the streetcars now, by the way, a bunch of other commuter trains lasted until uh, lasted as late as uh, 1930 uh, to some of the suburban places like White Bear Lake and Excelsior. So there's Thomas Lowry, and Lowry came into town uh, from Illinois. He was born in Illinois. Abraham Lincoln was his father's lawyer, and uh, he was always a great devotee of Lincoln. Lincoln was him. Lincoln was his idol. <laughs> I think that was a workers' comp claim happening. Lincoln was his idol. As a matter of fact, in the later years, in 19, um, um, he eventually, you know, bought Abraham Lincoln's funeral car and restored it over at the Nicollet Shops and put it up in uh, Columbia Heights, where unfortunately it burned in 1911. Um, but anyway, uh, so. Uh, it's 1891, and uh, in order to electrify the system, Lowry had to go deeply into debt. You've got to remember that this entire system was uh, functioned like a regulated utility. They had a, a franchise with each of the cities, which is why they still had separate, uh, why we still have separate tokens, and why um, uh, they still had separate corporate names, even though it was under Twin City Lines. Well, anyway, he was out on the East Coast trying to raise money because they had to relay the entire horse car system. In Minneapolis, it was switched it from narrow gauge to standard gauge. In St. Paul, it was already standard gauge, but they had to relay the whole line. They also had to create the entire overhead wire power generating system. This cost a lot of money. So he was out there in New York, and they said, you know, you could probably do better, his financial advisor said, if you were to merge these systems into a single company. And that's what led to Twin City Rapid Transit, better known as Twin City Lines. And this, by the way, the lo this logo appeared in 19, about 1905 when they expanded Lake Minnetonka. They came up with this logo. That's when it happened. So, um, we have the early horse car, uh, the early electric cars. The early electric cars were really just kind of overgrown versions of the horse cars. They had two axles. They were, they were exactly like uh, Duluth Car 78. Duluth Car 78 is an 1893 car. Look, you know, it's basically the same creature as this. Now, the problem with these cars was that uh, uh, a two-axle single truck, as anybody who has run 78 knows, uh, has a tendency to bounce. And, um, and from a passenger standpoint, if you get in 78, you know, you're just in little aisle-facing seats. And if you were in a, a busy streetcar, people are stepping on your toes. And uh, they didn't haul that many people. They were um, not particularly comfortable. Now, the um, standard technology on railroads was double truck, like all our other streetcars. And so it didn't take long before simply the demands. You have to remember during all this time, demand is rising dramatically. The cities are getting bigger and bigger. They're building tracks like crazy. And they're overwhelmed by demand. By the way, one of the things that, um, that happened with streetcars, with electric streetcars, is that now suddenly you can go 20, 25, 30 miles an hour down a public street, which had never happened in the history of the world before, other than the occasional galloping horse. Uh, and, you know, uh, mothers were scared for their children's safety, which probably they should have been. And there were preachers who invade from the pulpit that this was against the will of God. But people got used to going 30 miles an hour pretty quick. They didn't think the human body could handle that speed. Oh, yeah, yeah, there were concerns. Um, well, that had actually been proven on railroads already. Railroads were doing it, but, it, but uh, going down a public street. So uh, Twin City Lines experimented with, uh, with uh, various streetcars um, that, that were built commercially. And finally, in the late 1890s, Thomas Lowry said, you know, 
they're not up to Minnesota operating conditions. We've got to build our own. And so starting in 1898 through 1917, they built the Twin City Standard Cars. This is one of the first group. This is taken at uh, uh, Mounds Park in St. Paul. And both of those are in sightseer service until, oh, I think about 1911 or so. They ran scheduled twice a day sightseers. They made a big loop through Minneapolis and a big loop through St. Paul. And the two cars met so you could do one loop or two loops. And uh, so um, what you're looking at here, they saved the very first St. Paul horse car. This is over at Snelling Shops. Um, and this publicity photo, which was taken in 1921, shows 50 years of horse car technology improvement. And you'll notice it says one horsepower hay motor on the horse and then 200 horsepower electric motor 1921. And this, of course, is one of the standard cars after they had gone to pay as you enter fare collection, which meant that they put a fare box in the back and rather than the conductor going and collecting fares by hand and sticking them in his pocket. And to try and to uh, solve the problem of people of traffic jams and people trying to get in and out of the rear platform, they put front exit doors on them, so you could have a one-way flow of people through the car. Did that horse car ever get saved any later than then? No, that was one. They had a wood building on the Snelling shops that was just for storage, and it was in there along with Lowry's private car. And about 1925, the building burned down and it was lost, which is a darn shame because. Uh, We'd be running otherwise. Right. <laughs> well, yes, that's true. <laughs> uh, so, you know, one of the things that they did, and I'm skipping over a bunch of stuff. When we do the facilities uh, portion of this, we'll walk through. Uh, there, were, there were like three generations of streetcar facilities that they built at huge expense. There were horse car barns, early electric barns, and then the second generation electric barns. You're looking at the first of the second generation electric barns. That Snelling Station at Snelling and University and it was part of a huge complex that also included the shops. Now the shops, this is where the soccer stadium is going in at Snelling and I-94. Which, which direction are we looking at? Uh, you're, you're up on the Ward's Tower. You're looking, you're looking northeast. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you're looking northwest and then in the next picture you're looking straight west. And so, um, so the way it worked was the, st the streetcar station, they called the car houses stations, were where the day-to-day -day operation was. And that's where all the motormen showed up and they handed them the cars and they pulled out and ran the daily service. That's also where they did the light running repairs. The shops were heavy overhaul. That's where they built the streetcars and where they brought them in and, and every five years and tore them down and uh, fixed anything that was heavy that needed repairing. And so that's a transfer table in the middle with a little rolling platform so you could go back and forth between the buildings. And, and the point of this couple of slides is just to show they did, uh, you know, we talk about 523 miles of streetcars. I mean, this was all privately funded. Um, and here, of course, is the Selby Tunnel. Now, if you go over there today, this is all still there. What you're looking at is all still there. Um, and this was to get rid of the last remnant of the cable car line to go up and down that steep hill. Um, and this cut the grade from 16% down to 7%. Uh, but, you know, this is quite a public works job uh, to get this thing done. By the way, if you look, there's that retaining wall up on the, uh, on the upper left above the tunnel. That retaining wall is still there. You can walk right up and see it. Now, this, uh, this shows, because they were operating under franchises from the city, um, the purpose of this, uh, they were required to really try to serve the whole city. Now, uh, the rule of thumb in public transit is that you want to try to get within a quarter mile of people. So the rule of thumb is always that most people will walk up to a quarter mile, which is two long city blocks in the city or four short city blocks. Uh, and so what you're looking at are the streetcar lines and then quarter mile spacing beyond it. And you can see that the coverage was pretty good. And where there wasn't coverage, for the most part, there weren't any people. Or there weren't very many. One of the things that the city was always, uh, for, uh, was always pushing them to do was to build beyond 
the developed neighborhoods so that the transit would be in place uh, when the population showed up. The streetcar company always resisted that because, of course, they'd be out there running car miles and hardly hauling anybody. So you had this tension that never went away between the city and the streetcar company. The tension also extended to fares. The, uh, the nickel fare was an American institution that started in the horse car days and didn't go away until the 1920s. Well, costs went up. And, and for a long time, the streetcar companies were able to run because the ridership just increased dramatically. Um, and so they made it up on volume, essentially, but eventually it was catching up with them. The problem was that they had to go to the very cities that franchised them to get a fare increase. Cities were, and, the, and, and that's where politics came in, and the cities were darn not going to do it. So, starting in the 1920s, there was a huge fight that went to the state legislature. The fight went off for about 12 years or so, uh, where they, the streetcar company successfully got the state legislature to shift fair regulation to the state railroad and warehouse commission. So it got, gave, so there was some political distance created so they could finally get a fare increase. And that happened in about 1922-23, and they actually got a six cent and then I think an eight cent fare. Now, when they got to an eight cent fare, now suddenly it took, three co uh, took four coins to pay a fare, whereas before it took a nickel. That's when the tokens started. So you could have a single coin that would pay the fare. The other thing it did was the streetcar company offered the tokens at a discount. So if you went and bought your fares in advance with the tokens, you got a little break on the fare and you had the convenience of just a single uh, <coughs> coin as opposed to uh, having to put three coins in. Funny, the buses kept that right up until a few years ago. Oh, sure. They were still using those tokens. That's why we got them. Yeah. And if you got six, you got them for the price of five. Yeah, you yeah. You bought it at the downtown bus so, of course, the, uh, the streetcar system expanded, and um, not just within Minneapolis and St. Paul, but as you can see up to Robbinsdale, St. Louis Park, South St. Paul, and then, of course, the big suburban lines out to, uh, out to White Bear Lake and Stillwater in 1899 and out to Lake Minnetonka in 1905. And even more in Stillwater, a, f a few years after they built that, they went and they built three local lines that ran within Stillwater, Oak Park Heights, and Bayport. And so they actually had a little car house out in Stillwater um, and um, a half a dozen streetcars out there so they could run the local service plus the line into St. Paul. Would and Anderson have been there by then? Is that why the Bayport was an important link? Well, it was actually called South Stillwater at the time, and that's a good question. It wouldn't surprise me because there was all the lumber coming down the river and Anderson is a window factory that uses lumber. So um, that, that's, that's a good question. We should find that out. My, you know, that's why they went through the trouble of extending that down to Bayport. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't have enough well, well, the other thing they did, though, it also stopped at the front door of the prison. And you probably heard this story, that, uh, that the prison would charter streetcars periodically to run prisoners to and from, uh, out to Stillwater from St. Paul, and they'd be, they'd be shackled you know, to the hand grabs on the seats. <laughs> Um, and of course they hauled newspapers out there. They had a morning car that you could ride it if you want, but it was basically a newspaper run. And, uh, and the car was just full of bag, uh, bags of papers that they'd toss out all the way along the line, all the way to Stillwater. And then of course the line out to Lake Minnetonka. Now, the Minnetonka, it's, it's a complex story. Um, going to the lake initially, uh, you had the Great Northern to Wysatta. And they had the market from 1867 until 1881. In 1881, the Minneapolis and St. Louis built out there. In 1882, the little motor line built out there from Lake Harriet through Hopkins. And in 1887, the Milwaukee Road, which, didn't, uh, which went through Hopkins but didn't come that close to Minnetonka, built a branch line to the St. Louis Hotel in Deep Haven. So you had four railroads going out to Lake Minnetonka because there was this huge tourist boom in the 1880s. Well, that, that had pretty much gone away by the, late, by the end of the 1890s. Um, the, the rich, the vacationers had moved on to national parks out west and such. And so the little motor line had cut back to Lake Harriet in 1886, 
and James J. Hill took it over from Hopkins to Excelsior. He went and built a spur down from his line in St. Louis Park to Hopkins, and then he took over the little motor line right-of-way to Excelsior, and then he built around the south side of Lake Minnetonka through Zumber Heights to St. Bonifacius and out to Hutchinson. Uh, and a standard gauge that line. Then in about 1900, he took his line on the North Shore that ended at the Hotel Del Otero in Navarre and extended it out through Mound to St. Bonifacius and got rid of the line from Hopkins through Excelsior around the south side. That was 1900. So in 1905, when Thomas Lowry decided to go and open up Lake Minnetonka as sort of a working man's resort, he bought from James J. Hill the old motor line right-of-way and relayed the tracks from Lake Harriet through Hopkins on the old motor line right-of-way out to Excelsior. Now by this time, the Minneapolis and St. Louis had also had a branch line up the Tonka Bay Peninsula to the Tonka Bay Hotel, Lake Park Hotel. Lowry took that over, rented that branch line, and extended his streetcars to Tonka Bay. And then he also leased, either leased or bought, I think leased, the Milwaukee Road from Hopkins to Deep Haven and strung overhead wire. So there you see the streetcar company took over all the steam railroads that, that were going to the south shore of Lake Minnetonka and put in the service. And that was in 1905. And then, of course, they built the steamboats uh, that went everywhere on the lake about once an hour. And uh, the bridge that we are sitting next to, Linden Hills Boulevard and the William Berry Bridge, he lowered, had to lower the right-of-way for two reasons. One was that they were experimenting with double-deck streetcars and they wouldn't fit under the bridges. The second thing was that they built the steamboats, the streetcar steamboats, at, at uh, Nicollet uh, Shops, and they, they put them on streetcar uh, trucks with wood cradles, and they shipped them out. So the steamboats all came right through where we're sitting, out to Lake Minnetonka. Now, where you can tell that they lowered the right-of-way is you go down to the Berry Bridge, and you know how the steps come down, and then there's a little landing, and they turn and go sideways? That's, that landing, from there on down, is how they lowered it. That and the knee wall under the bridge is the lowering of the bridge that happened. Before that, the, the, uh, the track was up at the level of that landing and up at the level of the top of that knee wall. Yeah. Uh, the window company started in 1913 in Hudson, but then built the new facility in Bayport in 1913. Okay. Well, in that case, then uh, they they didn't build the line. They didn't build the streetcar specifically for Anderson, but it wound up serving them because it was in business until 32. And so, um, because electricity was still a big novelty when they ran the line out to Lake Minnetonka, they hung arc lights which were powered directly off the overhead wire um, and an arc light, an arc jumps between the two points and you know bzzz, and makes a and so every two poles starting up at 34th Street all the way through here to Excelsior they hung these lights and called it the Great White Way and nobody had ever had an illuminated railroad right away like that before in town so that was a big attraction. Now this is standing on Brookside Avenue in Edina, and you're looking west, and you're looking across Meadowbrook Lake. That's the Meadowbrook Golf Course off to the right. You can't see this view today because there's apartment buildings all built here. But to answer the question about speed, because there's, uh, we've had a certain number of people on their talks who said, oh, they ran 60 miles an hour through here. I need to clarify that. They were running about 40, 45 through this section here out as far as the city limits at France Avenue. It was not until they got past France that they opened it up to 60. And then the only cars that would go 60 were about the 40-some the high-speed cars that they built that had 75-horse motors instead of the regular 50-horse motors and taller gearing. Those would go 60. All the rest of it, the cars we run, would go about 40, 45, maybe 50, depending on, on, on how they went. Yeah. Did they have larger wheels also? No, it was just it was just uh, it was the same size wheels. They looked the same, uh, but uh, they had taller gearing uh, 
on it so uh, each RPM of the motor would get you a little bit more wheel turn and the motors were bigger. And they had more of a steel uh, cow catcher on it than the... Right, they had, right, they had a steel cow catcher as opposed to the fender because who knows, they could actually hit a cow out there. But those cars last ran in the 1930s. There's one of them right there. Uh, but Aaron, I hear you say one time that when the cars went to Stillwater, they needed a deeper gear to get out of the river valley. Right. They initially, right. They actually, initially when they put them out to Stillwater, they were the same group of cars and they would go 60. But yeah, they had to gear them down a little bit to, uh, because they had some steep hills out of Stillwater. And so they wound up being sort of like 50 to 55 mile an hour cars when that happened. And here, of course, is the transfer to the steamboat at Excelsior. So, yeah. Twin Cities lines actually ran out to Stillwater. It was yeah. It, okay. Yeah. Because I'd always understood that. No, it was from Hastings that somebody brought it up to Stillwater, wasn't it? No. no. Uh, Hastings. Um, it was the St. Paul Southern that ran to Hastings from St. Paul. The Milwaukee Road had a branch that went from Hastings to Stillwater up the west bank of the river, but that was a steam railroad. And so anyway, of course, the, the boats are on the lake, and the boats, of course, are a long story in themselves. Um, basically, they started with all, there were, four, there were always four routes uh, from, uh, to Wysada, to Minnetonka Beach, to Spring Park, and to Zumbra Heights. And it's what they did with those routes. There were three different eras. When they first started, all four routes ran out of Excelsior. And, um, and the streetcars uh, were street running every half hour. So two of them, in order to split the loads on the streetcars, uh, the car that came in on the hour served two of the routes, and the car that came in on the half hour served the other two. And uh, the, uh, the ones that went to the upper lake, to Spring Park and to Zumber Heights, had to go through the Narrows. To get there. Well, after they went and bought the branch line to Tonka Bay, they put in a little uh, a spur over to what they called um, Wildhurst, which was over by Birch Bluff on the west side of the Tonka Bay Peninsula. And they built a dock there, and, uh, and they, um, from then on, they had the two lower lake routes to Wysada and Minnetonka Beach connected at Excelsior, but the two upper lake uh, routes to Spring Park and Zumber Heights connected at Wildhurst. And what that did is that saved them one, one boat. Uh, they didn't have to go the, take the time to go through, and, uh, through the Narrows from essentially Tonka Bay to Excelsior, and that saved them a boat. And it was also made the trip a little faster. So, um, and then uh, after they got rid of the amusement park on Big Island, and after they got rid of the excursion boats, they also had a group of excursion boats that just did tours of uh, Lake Minnetonka. And these were older steamboats that had already been on the lake. They created, they used the express boats to create a continuous route on the lake where they do the Wysata route, then the Minnetonka route, the Minnetonka Beach route, then the Spring Park route, then the Zumba route, and then work their way back. And so if you stayed on the express boat, you could see the whole lake. But they still did that and maintained their connections at Wildhurst and at Excelsior. I'm sorry, it's complicated, but the, it was. Uh, this is Big Island. That boat on the left is either the Plymouth or the. Um, uh, I forget the other one. Um, there was one of the two boats, uh, one of the uh, one of the four boats that they bought that were already on the lake. Uh, the Puritan and the, oh, I'm forgetting. That, that were already on the lake that they used for just excursions. And then on the right is one of the Big Island ferries. They built these three big ferry boats that could haul a thousand people and they just shuttled back and forth between Big Island uh, and, uh, and Excelsior. There you are coming into the Big Island dock. Now the problem with Big Island was even though they hauled enormous loads and the Como Harriet line coming through here would have 60 cars on it on a Sunday, uh, as opposed to half hour service the rest of the week. Summer Sundays only were not enough to keep the whole operation afloat. It just didn't generate enough cash flow. So Big Island Park and the ferry boats only lasted from 1906 to 1911. And, uh, and uh, the, then it was kaput. Uh, now if you go out here today, all kinds of the ruins, that, that walkway is still there. 
The steps are still there, those two kind of porticos on the both sides. Um, either they're there or the, uh, the bases of them are there. Um, you can go out there today. It's now in Orono City Park. Now on the other end, uh, on the south east shore of White Bear Lake, was Wildwood Park and Twin City Lines owned this and this lasted until 1939. And there off to the right you see the streetcar headed for St. Paul. And so, you know, they had water slides and uh, concerts and everything out of Wildwood. This is a Stillwater. That's one of the high-speed cars. You see the Stillwater lift bridge in the distance there. Different today. No, 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 no. Well, not, no, not much. And then this is one of the uh, four uh, little lightweight local cars uh, running on one of the local lines. And then that's the um, that's the car house to the far left. And then the, the substation is the brick building behind. It. The substation is still there. That's at Owen Street. Uh, and so they had this little half hourly service that that just circulated around in. Uh, out there. Now you had the two private interurbans, and uh, this is the Minneapolis, Anoka, and Cuyuna Range, which went from Minneapolis to Anoka and didn't go anywhere near the Cuyuna Range. <laughs> but but if, uh, if you want to see an industry that was speculative, it was the interurban industry. The interurban industry filled a gap starting in the, the mid 1890s. They basically took streetcar technology and said, hey, how come we couldn't just run these between cities? And so um, interurbans were kind of overgrown streetcars that would usually use the local streetcar system track to get to the edge of town and then set off across the country. And they filled a niche. This was before automobiles had taken off, but they filled a niche the steam railroads really couldn't fill, which was frequent, uh, relatively short haul service, usually connecting uh, pairs of to cities or cities with outlying areas. And uh, we had only three of those in Minnesota. We had the Masabi Electric that ran the length of the Iron Range and, and the Masabi Range. Then we had the Anoka and Cuyuna Range. Now, if the car looks familiar, it's because it was built uh, Twin City Lines by Snelling Shops. And uh, they, they, uh, they sold four of them to this line. What's different about this car is it has a baggage section in the front. So the seats don't start right away. They, they have a baggage section because they would haul packages and stuff. And this is right down at Main Street, and the Rum, the Rum River is just beyond that boxcar on the left. So this thing ran until 1939, um, and it followed uh, what was uh, Coon Rapids Boulevard and East River Road. Now in the other direction, what Bill was referring to, is the St. Paul Southern, which uh, went uh, from uh, downtown St. Paul, used the Concord Avenue streetcar line as far as Inver Grove, and then set out on their own, <laughs> went through Pine Bend by the refinery, and then across country, and then this is it in downtown Hastings. Also doesn't look much different today. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. It, it kind of looks the same. And this was very typical of a lot of these streetcar lines, which were done speculatively. I don't, uh, this thing may ne have never turned a profit. And it only lasted, it started, I think, in 1913, and it quit in 1927. Killed off by automobile competition. Now, buses appeared right around, uh, the, uh, right around World War I. And what you're looking at here is the first bus competition. This is 1918. Bus competition on University Avenue, in this case at Fairview. Um, and this was a case, this was exactly like Uber and Lyft, where the technology outran regulation. And suddenly, uh, uh, first people um, bought automobiles, and it didn't take them long to figure out that, gee, I'm driving from here to there. Why don't I just, and I'm on a streetcar line, why don't I just stop and offer somebody a ride in exchange for the nickel fare? And so this, this is what they call jitneys. And people started doing that. And uh, the streetcar company, and, and, and it, it really depressed streetcar ridership. And the streetcar company cried foul. They said, look, we've got, we paid good money, and we've got this uh, franchise, and these guys are unregulated. And it didn't take long before uh, the jitneys grew up into buses that were running an unregulated, unregulated competition with the streetcars. And th what this thing did, 
was offered an express service between the city. The streetcar stopping every block. This guy was stopping every mile. And so he could make it from one downtown to the other, so he was skimming off ridership. So the, uh, the cities, in fact, it took a few years, but in fact they passed ordinances that made the, gyps, uh, the uh, jitneys illegal and uh, regulated the buses. And then uh, by about 1924, 25, 26, Twin City Lines simply bought up all the buses. By the way, they also bought up all the taxi cabs. So in the late 20s, they had an absolute monopoly on all pu street public transportation. And um, these became a, a subsidiary called Twin City Motor Bus. And so the streetcar company was running buses starting in the 1920s. And this, this service right here, this limited stop service, continued all the way through about the 1970s, quit for about 10 years, and then started up again under Metro Transit. And that is actually what the Green Line replaced, was it replaced the, um, it replaced the limited stop Route 50 buses and the, the local bus is still on University Avenue. It only goes as far from St. Paul to the Minneapolis campus, but it's still out there. And so um, they also recognized that buses, you could run buses cheaper to places where you couldn't afford to run a streetcar line. And so they started running buses uh, to uh, Stillwater via Lake Elmo. They started running buses well, uh, they replaced the streetcars um, going to Excelsior in 1932 with buses. This particular one is, is a bus going uh, up to White Bear Lake up Old Highway 61, which replaced the streetcars. So by the end of the 30s, about 10% of their business was, on, was with buses. And beginning in the late 30s, they also started replacing uh, some of their city lines. This is the Kenwood and St. Louis Park line. This is the very first day of replacing it with a bus. This was, I think, 1938. Because they, they, so they replaced a handful of their lightest patronized streetcar lines with buses. And this is an early Mac, and uh, it's, it was the first one they owned that looked like what we think of as a bus today, with a flat front and an uh, engine in the rear. And then, of course, along came the war, and they had a huge, uh, the, the ridership doubled. The ridership had been 238 million in 1920. It dropped down to 100 million uh, by the middle of the 30s. So it was cut by more than half. Along came the war, and it made it up to 200 million again. So it doubled. Well, their streetcar fleet was underutilized, and so they got about 20%, 20 25 percent more trips out of their streetcars. They bought 90 buses, and it allowed them to do some things that they never could have done with. Uh, uh, with, with streetcars. In this case, the Arden Hills, uh, the New Brighton Arsenal, they had to run service out there. And this is the day they brought in the night shift, and this is the day shift getting off. You notice it's mostly women. And then the buses are going to take them back to Minneapolis and St. Paul. So this is kind of your Rosie the Riveter story in action right here. Now, they were required under their franchises to plow all the snow on the streets that they ran on and also to maintain the pavement in the track area, which is to say the center two lanes of the street, and to do all that without compensation. And that worked as long as they were by far the dominant means of transportation. But when the automobile came along and took away the ridership, um, this was one reason for converting to buses. With buses, they didn't have to plow the snow and they didn't have to maintain the pavement. This is Nicollet Avenue in the 2600 block. And uh, you can see there's the big wing plow was out there. There was a three-man crew on these things. You had a motorman who was running the car and handling the front plow. You had the wing man who was responsible for that big, big wing plow sticking out. And then you had a helper on there. And uh, is that what that sign refers to? Uh, yes, that's right. That, uh, the sign we got a, this sign right up here yeah. behind him is uh, is an instruction sign off one of the snow plows. Cool. And that simply shows uh, kind of the ridership starting from 1930. You can see it drop off through the Depression, go up to World War II, and then 
after after World War II, the ridership rose through 1946 and then it started to go down. Uh, you had this huge pent-up demand for automobiles, and people just deserted the system, and that's why that's why the streetcars went away. But it was more the way it sounds. It was more of a gradual thing because yes, I always thought that it was there, but then they started putting buses in. So that, that yeah. Up. And here, just a, a view of the motorman uniforms. Um, this is what they look. This is what they looked like before 1940. Um, and if you see that uh, the hat badges with the big bla uh, numbers, the, uh, the black hat badges with the white numbers, uh, that's from 1905 to 1917. And then they went to the small ones that said motorman and the little numbers on the side. And then this is what they looked like at the end. In about 1940, they they adopted the uh, the bus driver hat that was in use on their buses. They got rid of the pillbox hats about 1940. And but you still had to wear a long sleeve shirt. You still had to wear a tie. You can tell, of course, who's a conductor because they got a changer. And of course, you the jacket was optional. They went to an Eisenhower jacket. And then, of course, in World War II. Um, you know, the ridership was going up tremendously. They were really stretched for people. And then starting in 1943, they began hiring women in July of 1943. And they hired 474 women. And first, uh, the motorettes who, um, and then about, oh, about a year later, they started hiring conductors, who then, of course, were conductorettes. And this, by the way, that's, uh, um, the gentleman is um, I, I'm, Reuben. I'm forgetting his last name, but that's him and I believe his wife in the in the car. He was already a motorman, Reuben Lundquist. He was already a motorman up at Northside, and so she came on and joined him. And then that's her her sister. And when we did the motorettes reunion back in 1993, all three of them showed up, and he went on to become the mayor of Plymouth. And so most of the motorettes lasted a year, two years at the most, and then the war was over and they went back. There were about, there were about 45, 48 of them that stayed on. And there was a layoff in 19, uh, about 1950, and that took half of them because they were low seniority. And there were about two dozen that lasted beyond 1950. And the last of them, Ruby Peterson, God bless her, uh, retired in 1980 as a bus driver for Metro Transit. And I remember riding Ruby's bus. Remember the old buses and they were manual steering? And Ruby was just this scrawny little, little, little bitty woman who wore a hairnet all the time. And she, and she, and she had run number one on the, on the Selby Lake line. And when she turned a corner, she had, to she had to stand up and lean into the wheel to turn the corner. <laughs> but she was a tough little bird. I, I remember riding her bus. Uh, then, of course, after the war, the question was, are we going to get rid of the streetcars or are we going to modernize? Twin City Lines decided to do both. They converted a bunch of streetcar lines in 1948, but they went and bought the PCC cars as well. This, by the way, was in direct uh, opposition to what their consultant told them to do. The consultant said, get rid of the streetcars. But Twin City Lines was very public-oriented, and they, they decided not to do it. And so, of course, you've ridden 322, and... Uh, and then this guy, Charles Green, came along in 1949 or 1949, and he's the one who did the. Uh, he saw the company as um, as ripe for the picking, because they had not been pay paying dividends, and um, he went in, engineered a hostile stockholders takeover, and um, immediately he he eliminated the uh, the streetcar overhaul program he cut maintenance he cut service he laid off people um and he got the fare raised so he started milking it and he uh, he, uh, he did such a uh, draconian job that uh he got kicked out a year later by these guys who were viewed at the time as the white knights but in fact they this was the group that uh got rid of the streetcars and that's Osana? Osana is the second from the right and they brought in Barney Larrick, who's the guy on the left, from National City Lines. And when you hear about the, um, the conspiracy of Standard Oil, General Motors, and, uh, and uh, tires, Firestone. Firestone, thank you.
Um, that, the, those three companies formed national city lines to take over streetcar companies and convert them to diesel bus because that would use their products. And um, Larrick had worked for national city lines. And uh, now what they were really doing was they were taking advantage of something that was happening anyway. The streetcars were going away and this was a business opportunity. Everybody has it viewed as the big conspiracy of the streetcars would still be here. Well, no, they wouldn't because the public had abandoned them. Um, but the electric plant was worn out and obsolete. The streetcars were, were all 40 some years old except for the PCCs. Um, and General Motors was willing to go finance 500 buses for them through General Motors Acceptance Corporation. <coughs> and so what they did do is they, they pushed it really fast and they, it took them about three years to get rid of them. Uh, and, and the reason that they went to, that Osana and a couple of these other guys went to jail was unfortunately they allowed uh, the local Jewish mafia, Kid Can Blumenfeld, and I hate to say it, a guy named Harry Isaacs, no relation, uh, who, was, who was one of the scrap dealers in North Minneapolis. Because, you know, the scrap industry in North Minneapolis was a Jewish industry. Um, that um, they were. Uh, those those folks paid kickbacks to them to get the scrap at reduced price and that was the illegal act and that's what, what caused these guys to go to jail and so um, the streetcars were gone of course by 1954 when, when did yeah. Thomas Lowry get up? When was he done? Uh, he died in 09. He stayed the head of the company in 09. His brother-in-law Calvin Goodrich took it over until he died in 1915 and then Horace Lowry, Thomas's son, took it over until the 30s. So, I mean, it was the, 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 that, that family basically yeah. ran it. Now, there's one of the cars, I mean, one of the buses. And then, of course, the only things that really had value left were the PCCs. And so they sold them to Mexico City. This is one of the Mexico City cars. They put a two in front of the digit. That's car 315. Now it's 2315. And... Um, they also sold them to Shaker Heights, and it's the Shaker uh, and and to Newark, New Jersey, and it's the Newark cars that are still around. There's 11 of them out in uh, San Francisco that have been completely overhauled in the last year. Um, there's uh, there's uh, oh a half a dozen others that are out at the various museums. We were the first ones to get one of them. And then I just put this up to show that everything old is new again. <laughs> this is the light rail in front of Minneapolis City Hall. Uh, and I think, I think that's it. Yeah.